I want to, uh, if you would, with me, can we pray one more time? Father, I, um, I was just reminded this, as I walked down there, this, this tragedy that took place in Pittsburgh, Lord. And God, we've been talking a lot about your kingdom and ushering in your kingdom and living in your kingdom, being with Jesus. And then we see these examples and these stories that are so egregious and so um, outside of your kingdom. God, I pray um, in the midst of, of evil that your, um, that your presence would make itself known. Lord, I pray that you would um, send up um, followers of Jesus to surround and support and to be, the, to be the hands and feet of Jesus to a community and to a people who are grieving. Um, and Lord, I pray, um, I pray that your church would would push back lord that we would usher in more of you um, into this world around us and that people would discover that um, here lord you are a great healer and we are a people in need of healing Lord, do your work and we ask these things in the name of jesus amen i am um, Last week at this time, you, you really could not turn on the TV or the radio um, without having somebody talk to you about the Powerball, right? I mean, it was 1.6, I think 1.5 something, $1.6 billion, um, which is an astronomical amount of money. And of course, every time the lottery gets to that level, it gets to be really, really large, it becomes a news story. And so um, if you did catch the news or if you did catch the radio, you would see people going to capture the, the experience of people rushing to these convenience stores and wherever it is that they buy their lottery tickets in order to be the, the hopeful winner, right? Um, to be the one who, who collects this enormous sum of, of money. In fact, in Virginia alone, at the peak of sales, they were selling 13,000 tickets every minute. Um, and, and so people, and that's just one state, you know, and for one minute. And you would hear these interviews. People would go and, and ask kind of like, you know, questions about what they would do with the money. I don't know if you saw this. I, I saw it several different places. Um, some people talked about paying off debt. Other people talked. One lady said she would buy a home, a new home for all of her kids. Thought that seemed generous. One guy said he was going to buy a boat. And I was like, That's, you got $1.6 billion. Like, you could buy, uh, you know, a big boat. Um, <laughs> people talked about putting their kids through college. Some people said they're going to retire and live the good life. I saw several people who, after whatever sort of expression of, of indulgence that they made, they would say, oh, yeah, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help the less fortunate, too. Like we kind of like people felt like I need to add that that tagline on there. Now, to be honest, how many of you spent at least a few moments daydreaming about what you would do with one point six billion dollars? I totally did. Like you should see the workshop that I would have with one point six billion dollars. And we would have Portillo's lunch every Sunday. Like that would be a regular thing that we did here. But as I was watching all of this unfold in our culture around us, it, it, it occurred to me that as I was seeing these interviews, there were really two types of people that were being interviewed. There were, there were plenty of those who were just having some fun and they're, they're spending a couple of bucks on the off chance that they might be the lucky person. But then they would also come across some people that were, you, you could sense in their answer, they were, they were coming from a place of greater desperation. Um, that, that this opportunity, this, this chance for them, they, this was something they needed. Um, they, they, in their minds, were purchasing more than a lottery ticket. They're buying hope. E even if it were just for a few days, the hope of something different, the hope of something better. See, this morning we are continuing in this series entitled With Jesus, where we've been looking at the the reality of what it means, what it looks like to live our lives with Jesus at the core of who we are, of everything that we say and that we do. And so over the last couple of weeks, we've been in sort of a subset of this series entitled Wrestling with Jesus. On these, on these questions that are directly asked of Jesus, where people come or, or people want to engage or debate with Jesus around certain topics. 
So they did, and, and there were topics like life in the kingdom, and what does that look like, and what does that mean for them, their, their understanding of morality and, and what it means to be good enough, what it means to live and dwell in the political realm. How do we engage in the realm of Caesar? And now this week, we, we get to the point where Jesus is asked about money. He's asked about money. It's funny because um, of all the topics that we're going to talk about, I think in some ways this is the one that culturally we're almost most reticent to discuss. We, 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 we feel that even next week we're talking about when, when Jesus discusses sex. Culturally, I think there's, there's, we are almost more comfortable with that than we are with engaging the topic of money. And I will readily and honestly admit that the topic of money is one that I would rather avoid um, for a couple of reasons, really. First is because I, I don't ever want somebody here who's coming to, to experience more of Jesus, to explore what he talked, uh, uh, taught and, and what it means to be in relationship with him and to explore what it means to be a part of the church and the community to ever feel like this is a means to an end, that your involvement here is a way to get at your money. I never want money to be a roadblock to the gospel. And that's why oftentimes when we do talk about money, at, at the church, when we're talking about needs that we have in the church or needs that we see in our community that we feel called to respond to, we, we always try to frame it in the context of generosity because we believe that God has been generous to us and we, the overflow of his generosity is the generosity that we're able to share with others. We believe it's actually a, a demonstration of the gospel. So I always, I always am nervous. I always want to be careful in this regard because there have been times in history when the church has not done this well and they have we have viewed people as a means to their money secondly quite frankly it's i don't want to really enjoy talking about it because it's not an area of my own personal life that that i feel like i've mastered uh, well, there's not really any areas in my personal life. I feel like I've mastered per se, but, but this has been an area of, of struggle, an area where I have struggled to trust God. And, and I don't want to stand up here and act as if I've got this figured out and I'm going to share with all of you how you can figure it out as well, because that's not the case. I'm not an expert on, on what it looks like and what it means to surrender to God when it comes to the place and position of money. And it's, this is an area that God has worked in my heart. He has stretched me. He's grown my faith. He's taught me things. But even in the preparation for this sermon, um, I could feel my own sort of discomfort in this, this, this battle for control that I, I, for whatever reason, I want to cling on to. And, and, and it exposed that, again, kind of in, in the depths of my heart. And so don't hear me today as, as coming to you as somebody that, has, that is coming to you from a place of, of accomplishment or success or that I've got this figured out. That's not the case. Um, and, and I've learned again in preparing for this sermon that that's not the case. See, the problem, however, is that my own desire to avoid this topic together and perhaps culturally our own desire to avoid this topic together, altogether, is that for us to do so, we would have to ignore significant portions of what Jesus talked about. See, the, the reality is Jesus talked about money a lot. He talked about it a lot. In fact, if you've got, I would encourage you this week, take time, read through the Gospel of Luke this week. I, I, in, you cannot flip more than a page or two before you find the, the issues of possessions or money or wealth being addressed in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus talks about it frequently. It's constantly coming up. He's teaching his disciples and, and he talks about a parable. It's, it's everywhere. In fact, if you look at the parables alone, um, anywhere there's about 38 or 39 parables and close to half of them deal with this topic. In fact, the only, the only topic that Jesus deals with more frequently in the context of the Gospels is the subject matter of the kingdom of God and what that looks like. 
You could add up all the times that Jesus discusses heaven or hell, or he teaches on sex like we're going to talk next week. You could pile all of those together, combine them, and it wouldn't still add up to as, as uh, frequently as he talks about the context of, of money and possessions and wealth. And so it's significant. And it's significant not because God has need of our money. It's significant because we have this need. And so Jesus is, is addressing it. So let's turn to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. We're going to pick things up in, in verse 13 and uh, read through verse 21 together. This is what Jesus says. It says, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me to be a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. He said, the, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Now there's, there's a couple observations that, that I want us to consider and look at this morning from these verses. First, I want us to take a look at that, that warning that's very pronounced there in verse 15. Then we're going to look at the parable and the parable of, of misplaced hope. And then finally that, what does it mean to be rich towards God? So let's begin by looking at the warning. I, I find this whole the, the context of this whole interaction, um, it's almost amusing. We, we get a picture of what's unfolding here earlier in verse 1 of this chapter where he says, Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered, so they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak to his disciples. So, so giant crowds have gathered around Jesus. And, and sometimes when this happens, Jesus, throughout the Gospels, Jesus will speak directly to the crowds. Other times, however, Jesus will turn and address or teach his disciples so that, or with full awareness, that the crowd is listening to what he's saying to his disciples. So as Jesus is essentially teaching his disciples to know what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to live in his kingdom, but he's doing this in such a way so that the crowd hears this. And that they can receive it as well. This is what's taking place. Jesus is teaching his disciples. And in the midst of this, this, this person interrupts and says, someone in the crowd said to him, hey, Jesus, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. So, so this, is, this is the context of Jesus' warning and the reason for it. Now, we, are, we live in a culture, and we're very familiar with with warning labels. We live in a litigious culture. People get sued all the time. And so there's warning labels on everything, right? And when you're a parent, you buy your kids toys, particularly if you buy your kid a toy that is, is supposed to replicate something that adults would use or like a, a toy tool or a lawnmower or something like that. If you see on the box, oftentimes it'll, there'll be a label, something that says not a real lawnmower, you know, in case you were confused about that, not a real like power drill, whatever. And then you open it up and, and the parts, there's a million parts and you open it up and there's a plastic bag and on the plastic bag, there's a table or a label that says not a toy. Warning, this is not a toy. Obviously that's happened because those are dangerous and, and you get that. But both of those labels, those warnings are essentially saying the same thing. This isn't the real thing. This isn't the real version of what it is that you're looking for. Now look at this warning again that Jesus speaks here in verse 15. He says, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. See, Jesus is addressing the heart of the issue here. 
He, he wants us to understand that, that this man has come to the right place. He's come to the right person, but he's asking the wrong question. Jesus, this man says, tell, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Tell, tell my brother to give me that which I need for, for life, to give me that which I need to have a meaningful life. And Jesus says, warning, watch, watch out. This isn't, this isn't real life. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Jesus here is identifying that there is a, the, 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 this disconnect between what this man believes he needs and what he really needs. And, and subsequently, in addition to that, what, in fact, Jesus has come to offer. Pastor Jeff and I, when we were gathering this week, we were talking about this passage and kind of wrestling through some things and we're talking about how Jesus identifies and, and labels this, this issue that's going on here as, as greed. And kind of as we were thinking about it, greed is sort of one of those things that, that nobody thinks that they have, right? I mean, in all the years that, that both of us have worked, we've never had somebody come. I've had people come for pastoral counseling and prayer with all kinds of struggles, all kinds of of sins, but because greed is, is primarily an issue of the heart, and because it is the, the water that we swim in, it, it's the fabric of our lives, our culture, we, we don't, it's very difficult to see and recognize it. And so people have come and, and they're struggling with lying or addiction or sexual sin or anger or jealousy or you name it, but neither of us in, in 50 plus years of ministry collectively have ever had somebody come to us and ask us to pray with them or to help them overcome the, the struggle with greed. It's never happened, not once. See, we can recognize greed in others. We, we, we see it all the time. Just like the example here in this passage. But, but it can, we struggle to see it in ourselves. We can be blind to the issue, and now as a result, we buy into the lie. We, we buy into, like this example here in this text, that, that this inheritance, that this acquisition of more, of money, of positions, of security, that this is ultimately going to provide us what, with what life was meant to be, what it could be. We, we have to get our share if we want to have the good life, true life. I, uh, I have known over the years a few guys who work in financial planners or they're lawyers or and, and they said that you will never see the ugly side of people like you will when, when an inheritance or the distribution of an inheritance is, is being discussed or revealed or delved out. Like people that even that you would say like, hey, these are, these are committed followers of Jesus. People that you start talking about money being divided out, it brings something out of people that is, is some of the ugliest side of us. Money, possessions, it, it, it riches, it's, it's always whispering to us, sometimes shouting us, I'm, I'm your life. I, I make your life possible. And so Jesus speaks into this and he offers this warning and he says, that's not life. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions, Jesus says. In fact, Jesus offers a very different definition of life. In John chapter 17, verse 3, he says, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Jesus offers a very different definition of life. So he's saying, look, you've, you've come to the right place but you're asking the wrong question of me. And so now in the midst of, of this question, of this warning, Jesus is going to elaborate by, by sharing a parable. And this is a parable of misplaced hope. It's a parable of misplaced hope. When I was, um, I don't know, maybe middle school, something like that, I was a part of this organization at, an, at another, like my dad's friend's church called Christian Service Brigade. I don't know if any. I don't know if they have that around here. It may not exist anymore. I don't even know. But it was like a Christian version of the Boy Scouts. You know, it's like you would get together and we would do boxcar races or not boxcar races, pine derby. 
Pine Derby, and we would go to camp, and you would earn little patches and all the sort of stuff that you did. And so the, the leader of our Christian service brigade was like, look, guys, like, let's, we were getting to uh, be a little older now, and he wanted to plan like a backpacking trip in Colorado. And we were all, there was probably like seven to ten of us in this group, and we were all so excited about this. And so we hatched a plan along with our leader, we're going to work all summer long. And we, he would arrange for people to let us mow their lawns. He signed us up to work at the fairgrounds during the county fair. So we did, I mean, we took out tons and tons of bags of garbage. I don't know if you've ever seen the garbage at the county fair, but that is not a pleasant job. Um, and, and we worked and worked and worked all summer long. And, and all of that money just went into a, a coffer where we're saving for this trip. And then one day we, we found out that our fearless leader had um, left his, his wife and family, taken our Colorado money, and ran. Made a run for it. That's misplaced hope right there. Like I, we put our, our trust, our hope, our money and somebody that was undeserving of it. I still remember um, that lesson as a kid and, and the impact that it had on me. Look at, look at this parable that Jesus tells once again. This is in verse 16. He says, And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yield in an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? See, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. See, Jesus, Jesus uses parables as a way of communicating kingdom value, kingdom truth to his listeners in the context of their own culture. And of course, this parable is no different. So the question then becomes, what does Jesus want them, want us to understand about, about his kingdom and money? And, and, and for that matter, why is this a topic that Jesus so frequently is addressing and coming back to? See, there's a, there's a key phrase here in these verses that I want to point out in verse 19. When this harvest has come in, is this, this is credible surplus, and, and he's coming to this conclusion, and it says in verse 19, and I will say to myself, or in the ESV, I like the way the ESV says, it says, I will say to my soul, See, I think th that implies more than just a, a, a logical conclusion. I think this is an expression of hope and security. And, and this is the principal point that the parable is, is, putting, is, is placing, is that this is a misplaced hope. See, the conclusion of, of this, or the conclusion of this rich fool, as the text calls him, is that he's set. Even that term fool that the passage uses here, that implies more in a biblical context than just a lack of knowledge. It, uh, to be a fool in, in Scripture implies an outlook that ignores God's reality. And this is exactly what's unfolding in this parable. He's come to the conclusion as a result of, of this influx, this supply that he's all set, that he's all good, and and he puts his hope there, a sense of security for the future. It's all in these, these silos holding the grain. And Jesus says, you fool. You fool. You're looking at your life and your world and you're ignoring the reality of God. So what, what's so difficult about this whole exchange? It's almost disturbing. Is that this is, this is a first century picture of the American dream. This is what our world tells us success looks like. Work hard, store up, retire in the Hamptons. This is what we're going after. And here's what we need to understand here. These aren't bad things. 
It, it's, it's not bad when there is a great yield from the harvest. It's, it's not bad when you've had a successful year at work and your boss gives you a raise. It's not bad when your retirement portfolio goes up. It's not an indication that you love money more than God. The question that I have, we have to ask ourselves in the midst of this, in good financial moments and in bad ones, is, is what does that say to my soul? What does it say to my soul? See, the reason that Jesus is so frequently and constantly addressing our relationship to money is because he understands what it reveals about us, about the source of our, our hope and our security. It's, it's, it's a lead indicator of sorts. There's an there's a NPR podcast in This American Life that asks the question, what is money? And, and by that, it's saying, why does this piece of paper, why does this stamped piece of metal have any value to us? And it chases the, the history of, of money through um, the lens of, of, of how it develops in a culture. And it's really just all a representation of our treasure. It's, it's just a, a picture of, of our treasure. So Jesus is, is so concerned about money because it's a lead indicator of where our heart's at, of, of what we value and what we place our hope in, what, what it reveals about us. So if I, if I were to project the last 12 months of my bank statements on the screen, what would that reveal about me? When Jesus comes to the conclusion of this chapter in verse 34, or of this kind of train of thought, it says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For where your treasure is, there will your heart will be also. I brought this um, chart that Sky Jatani created, it's kind of an adaptation of it, but, but I think it addresses this issue because it's, it's highlighting sort of the way we perceive or idolize money and, and the worship of God. And, and you begin to understand when you look at these side by side, why we conflate the one and confuse them. Because so much is emotionally, mentally, psychologically, it's all tied in in so many similar ways. But when you get to the end of the chart, you realize there are significant differences. And, and this is ultimately Jesus' point in this parable. Jesus is telling us, invest in, in what lasts for eternity. What, what Jesus has been describing is the kingdom of God the work that he's doing in the lives of, of people, invest in what will last, which Jesus then ultimately describes as being rich toward God. Being rich toward God. I am, um, you remember if you've had little ones, if you've nieces or nephews or your own kids, or kids you've been around, maybe little brothers and sisters, when they get to the age where, where they can start to eat more solid food, so you begin to give them a variety of different things, and, and you start oftentimes with some pretty gross-looking stuff, and it's like peas that are all mashed up, and, and they eat some of that. And then, then maybe along the way, you'll give them something that's really sweet, like uh, a pudding or something soft like that, right? And what does your kid do when you do that? It's all of a sudden, it's like when you try to hand them peas, they're like, no, like, I want that, right? Like, it's like they, they'll reject it, they'll push the, the, the hand away, and they'll even point and, and make their little baby noises and do whatever they need to do. I've seen, like, some of my friends have taught their kids sign language, right, to help them communicate what it is that they want. And when, like, the pudding is out, it's, there's sign language, going, that more sign, whatever that is, I can't remember. They're doing that over and over again. They're saying, I want that. Give me more of that. See, I've, I've wrestled so much with, with how to communicate this. When you look at verse 21 again, it says, This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. What does it mean to be rich toward God? Because the last, the last thing I want any one of you to hear this morning is that this, to be some sort of attempt to pile on guilt as a means to increase giving. This is not my heart. And if you are hearing that at all this morning or feeling that, please, please know, please forgive me because that is not my intention. But on the other hand, I do not, I do not want to just soften what Jesus is teaching us because he's the giver of life. 
And we see that at the very outset of, of this passage. When he talks about being rich towards God, that's the, this is the only place in the entire New Testament that this phrase is used. It's the only time. That there's other places where it talks about being rich in God, but this is the only place where the phrase rich towards God is used. So what does Jesus mean by this? And, and one caveat here. Oftentimes when I'm processing this stuff, or work, my mind will go towards somebody that has more money than me, and so I think, well, yeah, they really need to hear this, you know, like they, they could really benefit from this. Or um, I, I, I go to like just a place of, of um, shame and guilt of, of moments when I, when I haven't gotten right. And again, that's it's not what we're after this morning. We, collectively, when you put us on the world economy, we all qualify in the category of rich. Like we all, we all are in the, the top 10%, the vast majority of us are in the top 2% of the richest people in the world in this room right now. That's, that's where we land on this. But this isn't what Jesus is addressing here. This isn't ultimately what he's after. Jesus wants us to understand that being rich towards God is having your heart move towards the place where God is your treasure. Where we, like that child who tasted something sweet, say, I want more of that. And this is important. Being, being rich toward God doesn't just mean that we give God lots of money. God is not in short supply. The psalmist says he has the cattle on a thousand hills. To be rich towards God does not mean that we enrich God. But it means that we count God as our riches. It means that we say to God, my heart wants more of him. My heart wants more of you. So what does that mean for our money? It means we put our money, we use our money in such a way that it demonstrates that he is our true treasure. And, and this is what Jesus means when he says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for the fact that you are willing in your grace and mercy to address issues that were not only relevant, but sometimes difficult. And Lord, you've done that once again. In fact, you did that frequently because you understand, as we saw this morning, the way our hearts can confuse the two. So God, ultimately make this about you. Make, make our treasure um, to be found in you. And may our lives reflect that in the way we use everything you give us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.